Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are so happy to have you here um, for this wonderful panel on participation and pedagogy. Um, the, the, the title of the conference is Generation Analog, Tabletop Games and Education Conference. And so we always try to make sure that we have one panel every year on pedagogy, because we think that pedagogy is a really, really important thing, um, especially for people who play games and want to bring them into learning spaces in their everyday lives, um, in their, their classrooms, in their libraries, in all these spaces of informal learning that we have in our lives. So this is something that we really believe in here um, at Generation Analog, and so happy to um, uh, rein in uh, this conference with this year's participation in pedagogy panel. So, um, and participation, right? Like learning uh, is an active thing, Games are an active thing, they're interactive, and so this is all part of what we are here to discuss in today's panel. Um, so presenting today, uh, so first off, the general rules of the panel uh, that we all know are that presentations will be 15 minutes long, and this time is very strictly moderated, after which we'll have about 30 minutes of co open conversation between the panelists and the audience. Um, uh, so that's that. And presenting today in our panel, uh, we have um, Jorge Moya Higueras um, from the Neuro PGA research team at the University of Lida, Eric Stein from Trinity Western University, Michael Souza from the University of Coimbra, and Catherine, Catherine Croft from Cat Lil Games. I think I <laughs> mispronounced that. Um, uh, so apologies there. I'm very happy to have you all here. Um, we're gonna go in order of papers on the um, schedule. So we'll begin with Jorge's presentation. So Jorge, um, welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just going to try to... Okay, now I think you can see my first slide, isn't it? I think so, okay. So um, I'm going to begin. So thank you, thank you so much for uh, inviting us just to, to share one uh, recent study of our research line regarding cognitive interventions in, uh, with, with board games. Uh, I'm going to present the study Connectat Wand Online, playing in a pandemic to train your brain. Uh, after lockdown, in Spain, but we know that in, in a lot of other countries, uh, the um, children had several difficulties just to join uh, other children and relating them and playing uh, all around. But in Spain, uh, we think that maybe in, in other countries too, uh, family board games held up uh, during the pandemic. A uh, recent study showed that uh, a lot of families just found that they have uh, uh, a lot of time to, to spend with their children. And then just they began just to, to buy different uh, board games to spend time with them. Previous research uh, performed by your research team, by, but also by, by other researchers in the past, showed that uh, playing board games uh, had mm, several cognitive benefits when they were uh, used face by face. Okay, so we thought that it was a good idea just taking the chance of the of the pandemic and, uh, and the lockdown just to try if we can find similar results to the face by face intervention with cognitive uh, board games than uh, in, um, implementing these board games in an online format. So our objective was to study the cognitive impact on school age children uh, of an intervention program with board games implemented online, controlling different uh, variables such as the satisfaction when they were playing, okay? Uh, the, we perform a randomized controlled trial we began the recruitment uh, by our networks, social networks, and we uh, apply different inclusion and exclusion criteria, as you see in the, in the slide. And we uh, randomly uh, allocated 
15 children in the experimental group, the Conectar Jugando group, where they play different uh, modern board games, and 10 children were allocated in the waitlist control group. In this control group, they were waiting just for playing, so they uh, spend all the days of the uh, intervention in the, in, in the Conectar Jugando group just waiting, nothing else, or we suppose that doing nothing else than waiting. Um, the assessment of the outcomes were performed online, as you, uh, as you may imagine. Uh, we used different uh, classical tasks to assess uh, working memory, such as the keep track task, and also just uh, for measuring inhibition and cognitive flexibility, we use an adaptation of the five digits test uh, by uh, an online format. We also assess the uh, reasoning, fluid reasoning using the 24 test, and we also assess verbal fluency using a standard test here, here in Spain. And uh, after uh, each game session, we um, ask the children just to wait if they were enjoying uh, while playing the games and also during all the session. The treatment was guided by two psychologists and one senior psychologist. We performed the intervention 12, 12 uh, sessions of one hour play, two times per week, and the play groups were between two and four children. The main question, just to understand all we did and, and all the results, is that we adapted the analog uh, games to an online, for, online format by uh, using a, web, a webcam that uh, was focusing on the, uh, on the table where we had the cards and the dice that, that we used for, for the games, you know? And then uh, the uh, children were connected online with the platform of the University of Lleida and the researcher was, was the, the, the person that was moving the cards and the dice, throwing the dice, and then the children had only to uh, select which cards they wanted or anyway, well, what the game uh, should, should do, okay? So we tried to adapt the physical board from the analog game projected on the screen in real time, okay? In order just to enhance the motivation of the children to participate in our research, we used uh, some uh, uh, gamification elements, a narrative uh, regarding the wrong, the, the villain uh, COVID virus that uh, invaded from out of space our, our, our world, and we had just to play a lot in order just to, to, to beat him. Uh, or her, and then uh, through him or her throughout the, the space another time. Here you have the, the, the board games that we used, uh, BR, Streams, Monster Match, Blurber, and Sherlock Express. They were selected, where they were analyzed by uh, uh, the experts committee of Conectar Jugando, and we select these games because these experts analyzed them and showed us that these games were intended to activate the different cognitive processes that we wanted to enhance just by playing to, to these games, okay? Then uh, we perform the statistical analysis. We, as we said, as I have said, sorry, uh, we uh, assess the cognitive outcomes pre and post intervention. So we uh, first uh, checked the normality of the, of the scores and we found that uh, the scores didn't follow uh, normal distribution. So we performed uh, non-parametric analysis as you have uh, in, the, uh, in the slide, okay? So first we did not find any significant difference in, in any uh, outcome that we, uh, uh, that we assessed. The only significant difference is that is, it was that uh, 
that the control group showed higher scores on the semantic verbal fluency test than the experimental group, but no other, uh, no other um, significant difference were, was found. Okay, when we analyze the change between the pre and the post uh, assessment, uh, comparing the experimental group with the control group, we found that. In the, um, in the test of cognitive flexibility, the children that play with uh, the games online decreased the time performing this test greater than the decrease that we found in the control group. So we found uh, a better uh, performance after the implementation of, of, of the board games in the experimental group than in the control group. We also found uh, an analogous uh, result with the phonological fluency. The children that played with the games in an online format increased greater the level of uh, correct answers in the test of phonological fluency than the control group. But, however, we found an odd and strange uh, result. We found that only the waitlist control group increased their level of uh, hits of correct answers in the working memory test. Also in the semantic verbal fluency, but the main effect was found on the working memory test, okay? We also focused on the uh, paper or, or on the role, sorry, of the uh, satisfaction, satisfaction when they were playing. So just focus, focusing only uh, specifically in the experimental group, we uh, split it, the sample in those that uh, showed that they were enjoying a lot all the sessions and all the games, and uh, those participants that did, did not enjoy playing so much, okay? So what we found in this analysis is that the only, the only children in the experimental group that uh, decrease, so perform better the cognitive flexibility and phonological fluency test were those children that, that were enjoying a lot of the sessions. The children that showed low satisfaction with the games and with the sessions did not improve their uh, answers, their, their execution time and the correct answers in the test that we, that we used, okay? So um, we found several uh, significant results in line with past research when board games were presented face by face in a face by face uh, format, uh, such as the result about cognitive flexibility and phonological verbal fluency. And also we show that satisfaction, satisfaction when you are playing, when children were playing, is a very important outcome here. But we also found strange results that were not found in past research, like the control group increasing greater their level of uh, correct answers in the working memory test than the experimental group. Why could we explain these results? So we have several uh, explanations. The first one is like is is that uh, maybe playing online has side effects. Another explanation is that as we said, we did not find any significant difference between uh, the two groups. We also um, control the effect of the time playing to board games previously uh, engaging the, the, the experiment. So what we found is that the families that joined the, the experiment, all the families were used to playing board games. So we cannot discard that the, uh, the, 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 the children that were, that formed part of the control group were playing to different board games while the experimental group was playing to our uh, 
uh, more games, you know? So maybe the control group were playing to more working memory games than the control, than the experimental group, sorry. And that's why maybe we have uh, found this result, okay? So in future studies, we want to focus um, on the satisfaction when we are playing, but also control the effects of difficulty, expertise of the children when they are playing, and also why not just making a research, just comparing a face-by-face -face intervention with an online intervention, but not uh, adapting the game with a webcam, but using uh, well-established uh, websites such as Tabletopia or Board Game Arena that implement in a wonderful way all so several games that, that, that you can find, okay? So just um, three main ideas to conclude. First, it seems that playing board games in a non-analog format could entail cognitive benefits, especially if you like the games you play with. However, we found of results, participants in the control group were the only ones who increased working memory performance. So though some limitations of the study could explain these strange results, we cannot discard the possibility that playing board games in a non-analog format has side effects. So the main conclusion is, if you want to benefit the most playing board games, please play them face by face people and materialities. So I thank a lot different people that was uh, working hard in this, in this research directly. And here you have our social networks, just only because uh, in the future you want to join us in, in one of our online researches. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge, that was wonderful. All right, next up, we have Eric Stein. Hello, hello. Let me get this shared. All right. Can we see the presentation? Awesome. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Stein. I'm a, uh, an instructor at uh, Trinity Western University in British Columbia in Canada. And today I'm going to be presenting my talk, Play to Lose, Animation Failure and the Milia in Trophy Dark. So in this talk, I, I want to take a different approach than I do usually, which is to over-theorize and instead focus on practice. All too frequently in my work, I find myself following bypath after bypath, turned about amidst the woods and ruins, never to make it to the destination I set out to reach. There's certainly a place for theory, and much of my research efforts last year were concentrated on theorizing tabletop role-playing games. But here at this conference on people and materialities, I want to dwell on practice, be animated by practice, spending these pages to discuss a semester of play in the university craft classroom, and in particular, a three-part play session of The Witchwood Incursion for Jesse Ross's Trophy Dark. Published by Jason Cordova at The Gauntlet, Trophy Dark is a fantasy horror tabletop role-playing game adapted from Cthulhu Dark and Blades in the Dark, with a table, uh, table experience that owes much to the tradition of story games. Trophy Dark sets the expectation for narrative collaboration and improvisation early on, Players are recognized as co-storytellers with the power to introduce story elements that no one, not even the GM, was expecting. Every incursion, which is an adventure module in the Trophy Dark format, is structured around a theme. And as the Game Master's principles emphasize, the most rewarding session is one that brings the theme to life. The best incursions have a way of luring players into the story, just as their characters are lured deeper and deeper into the dark forest. My students' eyes shone with dread delight as we moved from ring to ring of the incursion, concentric scenarios driving us closer and closer to our doom. The Witchwood Incursion, written by Ross, plays with images, characters, and plots from The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Our group of player characters set off in search of Dora, following a crumbling brick road that led to a rumored green fortress. Along the way, they came upon a pair of magical slippers that drove their wearer to ruin and found themselves stalked by a monstrous lion that struck cowardice in the hearts of those who witnessed it. I chose the incursion specifically for this layering of literary elements, and my students were thrilled when they recognized the source and terrified to see what twisted turn the story would take next. 
This play experience was the final play experience of the course, which was an introduction to game design that I teach using tabletop role playing games. I had 15 undergraduate students under my care, 12 of whom participated in all three Trophy Dark sessions. And these players were split roughly in half between students with varying levels of experience with Dungeons and Dragons and solely Dungeons and Dragons, and students with no tabletop role playing experience whatsoever. Students came from a variety of majors, including a few from our game development program, as well as from media and communication, English literature, creative writing, and business administration. The class was conducted online via Zoom, with students spread between several countries. We began the semester by playing Ben Robbins' Kingdom, then proceeded through The Quiet Year by Avery Alder, The Skeletons by Jason Morningstar, and Dialect by Catherine Himes and Hakan Silioglu. Class time we spent focused on play, and then after each play experience, students would use concepts from the course textbook, Colleen Macklin and John Sharp's games, games, Design, and Play, to complete exercises reflecting on the games played during class. Upon, upon completion of our Trophy Dark incursion, which was our last three-part play experience of the semester, having built up a significant frame of reference for tabletop role-playing and a critical vocabulary to go with it, we then pivoted to a multi-week design intensive wherein students wrote and workshopped their own tabletop role-playing games. So this is the course. Throughout the semester, I was incredibly impressed with my students' openness to play and improvisation, and their willingness to be vulnerable and kind with each other at the virtual table. For my part, as both facilitator and instructor, it's important to emphasize that this does not happen by accident, and actively cultivating a safe play culture is vital to successful and healthy play experiences, especially when such experiences are taking place in a classroom between peers who did not necessarily choose to be there with each other member of the class, and when the games being played, like Trophy Dark, have the potential to dive into disturbing territory disturbing territory. And thankfully, a game like Trophy Dark has excellent content warnings um, to make sure you can uh, scaffold your play experience safely. As a facilitator, I made sure to set the tone before every session, laying out ground rules for interpersonal interaction during play, as well as lines and veils for the content that would be permitted at the table. We adhered to a fairly strict PG-13 content rating for all of our games, including Trophy Dark, which, rather than limiting the students, presented them with a safely bounded field for expressing their creativity on all manner of subjects. Conflict and violence, to be sure, but also such fraught domains as community building, family relationships, and personal identity. I owe so much credit to my students for being willing to play, to take risks, to share space with one another, and to be generous with each other as co-storytellers, all semester long. In the case of our Trophy Dark incursion, I specifically want to focus in on the concept of failure, which Trophy Dark enshrines in its three player principles. Embrace tragedy, don't hold back, and play to lose. By this point in the semester, my students were already well-versed in putting story first, and had become quite adept at playing off of each other's characters to produce drama. So when I read these principles from the game book and proceeded to tell my students that their characters should be desperate, complicated, and morally compromised, and that most of them were certainly going to die, the excitement was palpable, especially in a university course where failure and losing typically have such severe connotations and even material penalties, the prospect of embracing failure, of participating with the intent of losing, had a radical effect. Trophy Dark is elegant and precise in the ways it supports drama. My students were surprised and pleased by the playful ambiguity of the random tables for occupations, backgrounds, drives, and rituals. Some picked from the lists and some rolled for random results. Unprompted, students, students compared character sheets and started weaving bonds, intuiting relationships based on social position and aligning or opposing their goals based on motivations. In response to the question, what does this mean? I would always respond, you tell me. And the glee in my students' faces at this answer was wonderful to see. The key gameplay mechanics of Trophy Dark do an excellent job pushing players toward tragedy and failure. The balance of risk and ruin is a powerful instrument for drama, presenting frequent opportunities for things to go wrong and disaster to, to befall the player characters. Using ruin in the place of hit points is a brilliant bit of design, providing the facilitator with numerous handles for storytelling. For instance, at the end of our first session, which is character creation and ring one, the first scenario of the incursion, one player who had managed to reach five ruin of six maximum already through a rather uh, chaotic series of events, casually picked up the pair of iridescent shoes dropped by the witch the party had encountered and decided to put them on. I, not, not realizing that they were already at five ruin, 
told the player to automatically mark one ruin as, as dictated by the rules of the incursion. There was a shocked pause. The player staring at me mouth agape and, and then said, I'm already at five. What happens now? Rather than have them keel over and die on the spot, their hit points gone, I was able to reply using the text from the game, you lose yourself to the wilds that have been growing inside you. You choose whether you become a monster in service to the forces of nature and the whims of the GM, or whether you simply die. There was another pause as the student typed a private message to me in Zoom chat. Can I come back, they said. I have some ideas. Their character would reappear throughout the remainder of the incursion, becoming a key figure in the plot in a way none of us could have foreseen. Another mechanic that became the instrument of much drama was the Devil's Bargain. Every time a risk roll occurs, which is the primary role in Trophy Dark, the facilitator and other players at the table can offer bargains to the one rolling in exchange for an additional die. My students quickly realized that Devil's Bargains provided an additional means for shaping the trajectory of the story outside of direct in-character action. The bargains offered ranged from silly to somber and frequently involved elaborate ploys, devastating betrayals, and tragic losses. Through, one's devil, through one Devil's Bargain, one player character ended up with a sentient tree growing inside of them, which eventually sprouted as a second bark-covered head with the chosen name of Brock. At first a means of comedic relief, by the end of the game, Brock had become a character in his own right and served as a fulcrum for a touching moment between two of my students' characters. Again, nothing planned. This just emerged between my students, uh, just their desire to play to lose. In, group, in a group so large, conflict between characters is bound to occur, and occur it did. Unlike previous times that I've run Trophy Dark, this group made regular use of the contest role in all manner of contexts. Sometimes player characters disagreed about a course of action, and a contest role would help determine which way the rest of the party swayed. Other times, player characters, dri player characters drives would directly conflict, and a contest role allowed for tense resolutions of strife and interpersonal violence. Rituals were frequently deployed in creative ways and always to unpredictable ends, and more than once were the tables turned on an overconfident player who thought they could get their way. As the facilitator, one of the best features of the contest role is the way in which it levels the playing field between players. As mentioned above, about half of my students had experience playing Dungeons and Dragons, and the other half had no experience at all with tabletop role-playing games. As might be expected, the players with D&D experience tended to be more dominant in their play, uh, centering their characters and making it difficult for quieter players and those with less tabletop experience to participate. In one such situation, earlier in our second session, one player character, a disgraced town guard with a military background, tried to bully another player character, a mourning widow with some witchcraft up her sleeve, into following his directions. The disgraced guard thought that he had gotten his way, but clearly the widow was not on board, so I paused the action and invoked the contest role. First, we agreed what was at stake, recognition as leader of the group. Then we gathered dice. Each wanted to win the contest, so each took a few dark dice, risking more potential ruin from the role. And then we rolled, looking for sixes. The widow had the most. The guard looked at his role in disbelief. And to the guard with a face of stone, the widow said a single word, doom. And she slapped him in character. The player pointed to the ritual on their character sheet then to context what was happening. Doom, she said, pointing at the ritual. And said, since they rolled extra dark dice, it made sense in the story that the widow had used her ritual to exert her will against the guard, focusing her magic into the open-handed blow. One of the dark dice that the guard had rolled showed a one, so he marked one point of ruin. And for the rest of the game, players would joke about the slap of doom that changed the course of events, and that simple mechanical intervention that transformed the order of things. It is with this sense of transformation that I want to conclude, drawing on the philosopher of science, Isabel Stenger's theory of animation. Just a moment of theory. <laughs> to form an understanding of what happens in the practice of tabletop role-playing games and what happened in my class's collective practice of the rules and mechanics of Trophy Dark. In her essay, Reclaiming Animism, Stengers writes that reclaiming means recovering, and in this sense, recovering the capacity to honor experience, any experience we care for, as not ours, but rather as animating us, making us witness to what is not us. To be animated by an experience is to be lured into feeling to be compromised by magic, to encounter and be transformed by the not ours and not us. Trophy Dark expertly forces his players into such compromised and metamorphic encounters, short-circuiting player agency in order to teach players a different kind of desire, a different kind of play. 
The incursion is an instrument for this teaching, an assemblage or a milieu that beckons players into a new feel, the feel of failure, of tragedy, of disaster, and the feel of drama and of love. Rather than progress through skill trees, characters in Trophy Dark connect and contest with each other in rhizomatic networks of touch, subterranean systems that cannot be pinned down with criteria, only navigated by craft. Through our adventure in the Witchwood, we found ourselves caught up in the flux of participation, in the work of realization, as Stengers phrases it, that labor whereby the real is not disclosed, as some philosophers might phrase it, but made. Reclaiming means recovering what we've been separated from, right, Stengers, and regenerating what this separation has poisoned. The tabletop role-playing hobby, indeed the tabletop role-playing industry, is in many respects a poisoned milieu overdetermined by relations of bigotry and extraction that go back to fantasy gaming's roots. Beyond tabletop games, the students that signed on to Zoom to join my class in January of this year expressed a deep alienation and despair, a feeling that I too frequently share, grappling with an absent future realized by violent state apparatuses and predacious corporations. But as Stengers argues, the need to struggle and the need to heal are irreducibly allied if we are to avoid resembling those we have to struggle against, if our poisoned milieu is to be reclaimed. Through our time with Trophy Dark, we caught a glimpse of what such reclaiming work might look like in the tabletop role-playing game community. Nothing guaranteed or complete, always an imperfect realization. How, though, one might in a decisive moment stare power in the face and pronounce doom upon it, become like the Furies, taking back the future from those tyrants who believed it theirs. To bring theory back to practice and to close, I'll make just finish with one final anecdote. After our story ended, while debriefing as a class, one student who had participated less than some of the others remarked how they never knew what to do, because any time they wanted to act, their actions would put their character in danger. They said, it's like to do something, to do anything, to, ac to, to accomplish anything, you have to accept that you might fail, that you might lose. And perhaps it's straight to say, but that is precisely the point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a wonderful talk. And uh, next up, we have Michael. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Is that okay? Okay, so let's put the timer. So thanks for this opportunity. I'm, my name is Mikael Sosa. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Coimbra from the Civil Engineering Department, which can be surprising and I'm, kind of an alien in my department because I use games to create serious games and to create spatial planning and urban, urban planning for the citizens and stakeholders to participate. But here I'm, I'm sharing some experience uh, when I was invited to conduct some lectures in the Lusophone University where I try to use some board games to teach video game students some game elements and ways so they could uh, prototype and develop games. I'm trying to share that those experiences. So they invited me for some classes. These were the video game students. They were not that experienced with uh, analog games or board games, or whatever we want them to, to call them. And they they asked me to, to conduct some, some uh, classes. So what were the objectives? The objectives were to introduce video game students to other game formats, platforms, and types of games, and uh, to teach uh, general game design concepts to those students. And this was meant to be an experimental and a practical way for them to learn by doing with their hands on, on the games. And I tried to do this bringing games to the classes. So they would play in every class with me. And th there were some limitations, of course, and some requirements. Uh, there were a predefined, a predefined content for each class, the, the, the game design topics that I should approach in every lesson. They, they were defined by the, the leading professor of the, the course and the several disciplines uh, that students need to, to do. And there were a limited uh, quantity of time 
from six to eight classes, three hours each. So this was these were the limitations, and every class it was between twenty five and thirty students each turn. And uh, I, I I needed to use the rooms that they usually use for video game uh, lessons with a lot of computers and not a lot of tables and not a lot of space for us to move. So this was the the conditions, the first conditions, the practical solutions. Uh, how, how did I do this? Uh, I reserve uh, uh, 30, minutes, 30 minutes or one hour at least to play some adapted games each class. So I've done some expo exposition of the content and then play the games. I needed to select games that were not expensive and that I could afford several copies of the same game so every student could play them. And they would need to be easy to learn. So I was the only professor, the only facilitator, and I needed to teach the game fast to every student. And they will, they, they must play the games by themselves from start to end. And I need to teach several tables at the same time. So this is a challenge. And we needed to change the layout of the, the room every time to move the tables and the, and the, the chairs so we could play the games. So some of the topics, um, the player, player profiles and game experiences, game systems and game elements, mechanics and mechanisms, positive and negative feedback, symmetry and asymmetry, game balance and economy, prototype, prototype development. So this was some of the topics that I approached approach in each class. So how was the method? I've done some expositive content, some PowerPoint, something very traditional, very common. Then I would refer for, to game examples, a lot of images of games during the, the, the exposition, expositive content, and then play the games, play the adapted games that I selected for each class, and then uh, debate after playing the games, and then connect and reinforce what uh, I've presented in the, the PowerPoint presentations and use the examples for the next classes whenever I, I've stated an example of a game. So this was a reality. This is a class. They are playing. You can see the layout, several tables, computers there, and they are playing the games. Here they are playing Sheriff of Nottingham. It was about uh, bluffing and negotiation in this type and game balancing. And some examples, for example, collaboration and competitions. I've used Miss Tacos and Miss Cadas. You might know the game by chairs simply. Uh, and I've provided them the game and the, the game components without any rules and asked them to build a collaborative game with the pieces and then create a competitive game with the same pieces. And they needed to discuss this, define the game rules, test, and justify whether uh, this was a competitive game, whether this is a collaborative game. And you can see them here uh, uh, interacting with the game pieces and the game components to create uh, their game. So I needed to carry a lot of games to do this, but I believed it was useful. More examples, for example, game economy. Here they played Power Grid and Splendor, two games that I could play with them with some adaptations. For example, they did not play the Power Grid the whole game, just two thirds, so they can see the, the feedback of the economy each time and can, they can, can experiment the auctions and can see the changes of the player board. For those that do not know them, this is these are very, widely known and very common modern board games from two types of Euro games. So they, they are strongly uh, focusing on the economy of the game, the quantity of resources, uh, some open ended and, and uh, closed economy. So we can use these as examples. And now you can see them playing the games in several tables. And this forced me to adapt the game because sometimes I have seven and eight students. So I need to create more game components, bring these components to the game, change the rules. And this requires a lot of adaptation in real time so they can see the examples. 
And then we can see here the playing splendor also. So this was done as a complement for the classes where we we tried to to teach them about game economy, uh, and this was a complement to the the contents. So what was unexpected in this? Uh, students were not used to play these games during classes, although they were video game graduation students. Uh, they were expecting only expositive content, so this surprised them. And when I asked students some uh, some um, some commentaries on the on the games, they simply respond, "Games were fun," and this was very surprising to me uh, because uh, I wasn't used to teach video game students. I was hoping for something more elaborate, not just fun or not fun. And uh, students reveal behavior that was not suited for classes <laughs> due to engagement. Sometimes they scream very loud, they laugh very loud, and they were swearing. And I use these as examples to, to talk about engagement and the, that games provide uh, experiences and change their behavior. So even if they were creating games that were not ortho games, not games just to be entertaining, they could be uh, creating gamification and CS games. Uh, and they could do this by starting from the kind of experience that they, that they wanted to, to create in the users. Uh, and some students were not engaged and others were very engaged. This was also surprising because we are expecting that all these students are very uh, fun of games. And this is not as, uh, as I expected. And this was also a surprise. Some students invited another st other students from other courses to be playing the games. And of course, I welcomed them because I had uh, a hope that even if they were psychology students or, or any kind of students, they could, uh, at the end of their uh, degrees use games for uh, in their projects, for example. I hope that, and it was very interesting to see that that happened. So some opportunities. Uh, the practical examples were continually used to frame the next lectures. Because they tried some games, they the students started to to invoke these examples to question me and to frame the concepts from the next lessons. Uh, the improper behavior, I used it as an example to show uh, engagement, immersion, and the concept of magic circling practice. They totally lost in some games, in some groups, the notion that they were in a class and that, that I was the teacher that was evaluating them. Uh, and when I, I stated this example, uh, they became very serious because they were worried about uh, and they they lost track of the notion that they were in a class. They were being evaluated, and some uh, some um, behavior was not acceptable. But I believe it was acceptable as an example to understand the kinds the kinds of experiences that games provide. So I think this was very useful, uh, and we could address individual player engagement in different games as ways to provide. Uh, examples to address player profiles. They, the, play, the students realized that some games were not made for them because they did not like the experience that that specific game uh, created. And this was done in practice. And then we, can, we could, at the end of the sessions, go beyond the fun analysis. And they, they then they started to analyze games uh, as systems that provided interactive experiences. That was what I desired that they started to see games as systems and not just as uh, activities that provide fun, because we know that some games might not be fun and might be engaging anyways. It depends on what we create for the game experience. Uh, some indi indirect uh, results. Uh, the the, the players change some of their behavior. They were more, more conscious of uh, all types of games and platforms, and some students start to build analog games to prototype their projects. 
we've seen we've seen this in previous sessions and some of the sessions of the university where they create a lot of uh, game jams and similar events and analog games started to appear more naturally and this was a, a way to reinforce the prototype and game development even for the video game and digital games we started to see some early prototypes that would support game development uh, and um, this forced me as a teacher, as an instructor, to create frameworks to support students, uh, to teach them game mechanisms and to make them realize what kind of experiences games could provide. And now I'm working on game, on the uh, game frameworks to teach game design. And this was something that I found it was necessary to support this kind of lectures. And we can see here some of the examples of the games and prototypes that students started to create. And the first step of my framework that now is very different from this uh, first uh, version, but it has been very useful for me as a game teacher and game instructor. And I thank you for your attention and uh, I apologize for the level of my English. You've realized I'm not a nat native speaker. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to to listen to me and I'm here available to answer anything you want. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. And apologies actually for mispronouncing your name, um, Mikhail. Um, uh, all right, um, last but not least is Catherine Croft. And Catherine, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay, let me start this. Okay, um, so my name is Catherine Croft. Um, my topic today is talking about um, gatekeeping within family board game audiences. And the reason I'm, I'm very interested in making games more accessible to the public at large. Um, so about me, um, I'm actually, I wear three different hats. So I am a neuroscientist. I got my PhD in neuroscience from the University of Virginia. Um, and then I did eight years of biomedical research, um, mostly at the NIH on how um, synapses develop and how uh, learning and memory can affect synaptic um, function. So um, I loved research, but long story short, I wanted to um, spend more time with my children. And I'm very interested in bridging the gap between scientists and the public. So I became an educator. So I'm actually now a high school teacher. I've taught high school for seven years now in a public high school. And um, before that, I taught for two years at a science center where I developed life sciences curriculum for ages three to 12. So I'm very much experienced in teaching um, at the K through 12 level. Although with my background in higher education, like I'm, I'm familiar with those audiences as well. Um, so my mission is to create science themed games that are fun and accessible to the public. So it's not like a trivia game. It's um, something that the, the learning is based in the game mechanic itself. And that by playing the game, you learn indirectly. And so uh, we have, I, I co-founded Cat Lily Games for this mission in 2015, and we have several games, one of which Cycles was just funded on Kickstarter, and then um, the other picture here is Starsmith, which was featured at the Smithsonian American Art Museum Arcade. Um, so I, I'm very much a mission-based game designer, and so this talk here is like a, a kind of a, a new extension of my research that I'm really excited about. So the problem I see um, is that how do we make this amazing world of modern board games more accessible to families? Because believe it or not, most families um, aren't even aware that like new modern board games exist. And I know that's hard for us to believe because we're so embedded in this world, but I, I very much interact with you know thousands of families through over the years and they really don't know about this amazing world. It's slowly like seeping in, but... Um, they're like, if I ask them what their favorite game is, you know, you know, besides like Monopoly or Uno, like they don't really know beyond that. Um, and so, so I've had this question a lot based on this research is that why can't we just have hobby gamers be happy with their games and the public be happy with their games? Like why, why, like everyone just finds their own 
um, game that they like and what's the problem with that. And so there is no problem with that, except that I see a great opportunity. And that is for us to reach mass audiences with amazing new themes and content that they wouldn't normally have. So we like we know from our hobby game world that there are brilliant games about like societal awareness, like things like climate change, things like that. Content knowledge, like, well, with my games, for instance, like as an example, there's many games like this where you can take content and sneak it into people and raise the like awareness of science concepts or whatever history or whatever it is we're trying to get across. Um, and then if they find these and they like them, obviously the more you play the board games, the more you develop social emotional learning and hone your critical thinking skills. And that kind of helps, you know, critical thinking at large in the society. Um, so that's why I see an opportunity here. There's nothing wrong with hobby gamers liking complicated games or mass audiences liking Monopoly. But I, I think that we have an opportunity to reach more and do good for the world. So, um, so I started doing this and I started with Board Game Geek, the top 100 family. And um, that's because like designers looked at Board Game Geek and, um, you know, as kind of the staple of what is a good game and what is not a good game. And um, also like hobby gamers look to it like, oh, what's going on? You know, so designers very much look to what the trends are and, and what's taking off and how they can do better. So of the top 100 family, only seven, so 7% were actually in the Amazon um, top 100 board game bestsellers. And um, when I attempted to limit it by family board game, it just comes up with like board games. So I did the top 100 board game bestsellers. So you would think, okay, that's just going to be like something silly and common, like, you know, like Monopoly or something like that. Um, although working designers don't like Monopoly, right? But here's the actual list if you're interested. So the ones that do overlap between the board game world and the public are um, Wingspan, Cascadia, which just won Game of the Year um, at the Spiel de Jar, and then Seven Wonders, Codenames. This one's Duet, because I think it's like the newest version, um, but Codenames. Um, Clask, which is kind of a dexterity game that came out um, in 2014, and Ticket to Ride, a classic, and Carcassonne, a classic. So these aren't like, um, I mean, they're more, not everything's lightweight here, right? It's not like some simple, you know, pie face or something like that. Like the public is ready for games that are more complicated and interesting. And so I think that, you know, we're underestimating what they can handle since they like games like this. Um, so, let me see if I can minimize it. Um, I don't know if you can see. But um, so overlapping, um, so I was looking at the, the subset versus the whole group. And so in the non-subset, so it's, my subset is only seven games, right? So I can't do stats on that and I have a wide error. But um, if you look at the whole set, um, it's the, versus the subset. The subset tends to be sort of older and it tends to be slightly less complex. This is obviously not um, significant statistically, but like I do see a trend going towards that direction. Um, and then I think I'm, I'm gonna extend it towards lower games down the ranking, but this is the initial top 100. Um, and so Something really interesting I found. So when you look at the age groups, again, my error is large because I only have seven games. Um, the BGG, Board Game Geek, the ages um, was about, you know, 9.6 on average. And then the overlapping was lower, like nine, 9.1. But what I found was that Amazon actually lists different ages, the manufacturers and then Board Game Geek. So it was really fascinating. And um, I was like, that's curious because there was a lot of games that um, Board Game World thought it was like 10 plus. And then Amazon Public World like deemed it as 14 plus. And so just to show you some examples of this. So of the 165 matched exactly ages from Board Game Geek and Amazon. 
but 27 of them, so 27%, um, were actually lower. So we designers estimated them to be more accessible to younger audiences when in fact, Amazon or the public deems that's not, they're actually too hard. They're harder than we think. And then I also did find eight games, so 8% that board game geek ranked higher than the public. So there seems to be some kind of disconnect in like what we think is a good age range as opposed to what in practicality is a good age range. Um, so just to show you some examples, um, the ones that were higher, um, so the ones that board game geek rank lower are listed here. These are the 27. And so Wingspan um, is listed by the manufacturer as 10 plus, whereas the Amazon age is actually 14 plus. And as you can see with Everdell and different things, um, Crokinole, I don't, I was surprised that I was ranked higher on Amazon, but you can see there's a, all these games that um, we consider lightweight in the hobby game world, um, the public thought were harder than they were. Um, and then board game games that were ranked higher ages on board game geek um, were here's the eight that I found over here. And so um, these were interesting as well. So it's not just like they're all mislabeled as lower. There is some higher, but it is interesting that there, there's a disconnect there. And so perhaps we need to get a better understanding of the age groups that we're actually targeting with these games or who can handle them or enjoy them. Um, so, um, something I've seen before, um, that I thought I would look at is like, so board game geek, um, in general, um, when I go to these talks, it, people say, um, and like anecdotally, it's like the games that are ranked higher are the newest games and the more complicated games, which if you look through it, it seems true. So uh, this is in the just the top 100, mind you. So it's only the top 100. I did a correlation um, examination between the year versus the rank and the complexity rating versus the rank. And if you look at um, the lower ranked games in the year, like there really is no correlation between, at least in the top 100, between the year it was published and the rank. And the same with the complexity rating, like the R squared value is not as very low. So this is within the top 100, but I did start to, I have in the past few months, I've like expanded to look through um, all the way down to like rank 500. Cause it's possible that 100 is just not big enough for me to see a difference. So just to see like the ones that are ranked 400 to 500 versus like zero to 100, if there's a difference there, and as you can imagine, that takes quite some time. So I'm still working on that. Um, so what I decided to do, just check my time here, um, is what to be useful to me, who's trying to reach mainstream audiences. Um, I wanted some kind of new ranking, like, cause there's older games, you know, like Clue or Risk that are not on the top 100 of the board game geek, but, they're great mechanics and great games and like they've held up for a reason and they've become inspiration for a lot of these modern board games. So um, those who do not see, so I wanted to see, okay, what if we took a new ranking system that was half based on what designers think and what hobby gamers think is a good game versus what the public thinks is a good game. And, um, and then combine them together into this kind of new ranking system that's more reflective of what is like the public at large would think is a good game. So the first thing I did, well, I curated both Board Game Geek and Amazon. So I took the top 100 from each. And then from Board Game Geek, um, what I found was the, the top 100 of Amazon, they're not all classified as family board games and Board Game Geek. So there's a, a disconnect there. So I actually had to change for this ranking system, I had to go back and look at their overall ranking and um, sorry, let me here. Um, and so look at their overall ranking and take that for just for this purpose. And then for Amazon, I um, decided that to have a more consistent ranking, I had a scoring formula of not just their star rating, which is like one through five, five being the best, 
but also the number of voters that thought. So I had, I multiplied those together to get a new scoring system. And I also excluded things that were really just like toys. Um, like for instance, an example is like, let's go fishing where it's just like a battery operated fish and you fish them. Like that's not really a board game, right? So also like character, like there's multiple games that just were the same game with just different characters like Disney or whatever. So I took those out as well. And then I rank ordered each of those and then summed it together to create the final score. So let me show you an example. Okay, so examples like, so on Board Game Geek, um, here's just five examples. So they're in order of the overall Board Game Geek rank. So this family game ranking of these top five. So Gloomhaven, Forgotten Circle, that's actually considered a family board game, which I think most families would find a bit much, but I mean, that's my opinion. But um, the board game geek rank overall, I changed it there. And then I assigned a new rank, just one through five based on the order. Same thing with Amazon. You can see like, this is just five examples here. Here's um, the family game ranking or the, the game ranking and then my new score and then the rank. And then for example, when I combine them together, this is actually the same games in the Amazon table here. Um, I have the Amazon rank plus whatever their new board game geek rank was according to my rank order system, out of those two together to get a final score. And then I ranked those. So when I did that, I wanted to show you. So here's the top 25 based on my new system. Um, and as you can see, there's a mix of like modern board games that we like hobby gamers like approve and <laughs> think are fun and, and good, uh, well designed, um, and some classics that we wouldn't necessarily include in the top like board game geek. So like Code Names is number one, um, Catan or Ticket to Ride, but there's some great like logic and like, sequence. Chess was not actually in like the top 100 of board game geek. Um, and so Villainous and all these things, Connect Fours and there, Zingo is a great learning game for younger kids. So I, I feel like there's a, a strong mix that might be more reflective as designers when we go into this, like we don't have to make Wingspan every time, like Wingspan is wonderful, right? But like, it's maybe a little bit too complicated and we can also make more lightweight games and hopefully not be shunned, which is why I call it gatekeeping is like, um, we don't want to feel like lightweight games are not welcome. So my last slide is just um, opportunities that I see here for game designers to create more lightweight games. Um, I mean, additional lightweight games that retain a lot of the cleverness and modern game mechanics and innovations that we've had, but just introduce them to wider audiences that will become, you know, will love our, our board game world and join our board game world. Um, Catherine, and they can also. Oh, sorry. We're, this is my we're last unfortunately slide. at time, but um, okay. Uh, I, I hope Thank you. that um, the audience brings you back to this slide to ask a question on it. Um, and <laughs> thank you for the the wonderful presentation. Thank um, you. Yeah. So uh, I thought this was a great um, set of panels. I think it um, asked really uh, provocative questions about. Um, how people at all ages um, play games and interact with games and perceive games. Um, and I think it also um, asked us all to question uh, what the role of games in um, educational context was in some really, really fundamental ways. So that's kind of my, um, my, my big question to everybody on the panel is that, right, like edu educational in as an institution, right? It, education is an institution. Um, it's a form of, um, uh, acculturation, it's a form of indoctrination in some, time, in some cases, um, right? There's all these sort of techniques that educators use um, to indoctrinate students. And I was really struck when Mikhail was talking about the students swearing as being um, improper behavior um, in the classroom, um, because I, I think this is something, you know, like that's a rupture, right? Like that the, the normative kind of acculturation the classroom is trying to do there um, is being challenged. And I think that made me actually wonder for all of you um, what what you think the 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 role of games in the classrooms um, is, and if there's maybe a potential here to rethink education on a whole as people come uh, to play games and bring games into the classroom. So 
Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear any panelists' opinion on that question. Um, I actually have very strong opinions on that. So I've been pushing for games in the K through 12 classroom for years and years and years. And I can tell you, and I think Jorge and I talked about this last year, is that um, they're an extremely effective way of learning and teaching, um, but the teacher plays an important role in scaffolding both before they play the game and after, so you can make sure they extract what you want them to get, but they also um, have to have fun, and that alludes to what Jorge was talking about in his talk, like, it can't be like, I think Michael actually mentioned this too, it can't be like, okay, class, we're learning, I'm going to grade you. It, they're not going to learn as much that way. It has to be like, I'm having so much fun and I'm linking this happiness and these emotions and then this engagement to whatever I'm learning from the game. Otherwise it doesn't stick and it doesn't really work that way. Um, most teachers are opposed to using games in the classroom, at least K through 12, because they think it's a waste of time um, because we have very limited time and we have standardized tests, unfortunately still that we have to pass. And so a lot of them just cram facts and worksheets. Um, I argue that it's not, it's actually a really effective way of learning things um, if they just realize that you can convey content knowledge with certain games. Can I say something? Well, in this case, this was a surprise from, for me, the, the swearing and those kinds of behaviors, but, uh, in that moment, I realized that this was exactly what I want them to experience. Because when I say that games is a good way to learn or a good way to train something, it's because it's based on player agency. So they do something, they see the result of, of what they've done, and then they can realize, can analyze, and can internalize the contents that I've tried to pass to them by uh, picking that game or changing something in the game. And I've told them this, that in a normal situation where I was not profiting from that kind of emergent behavior, they could be, uh, uh, they could be at a negative evaluation, but I will not give them the negative evaluation because this was part of what was intended. Uh, I did not intend them to swear and to talk, uh, to do to do trash talking, of course. But I want them to experience uh, to to do to experience the experiences of playing games. And I think that uh, when we do this, we must be prepared for something that is not uh, that is a, can be a surprise. But uh, we can we need to foster and to, and to profit from this player engagement and these kinds of behaviors because it's the, the strongest parts of playing games, I believe. Other thoughts? Yeah, kind of two, oh, sorry, I went. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, kind of like two, two separate streams here, like games in the classroom. I think, you know, if, if we're all here, I think we can all agree. Yes, games in the classroom are amazing. Um, my favorite part about running games for students is that you get to see your students as people and like in ways where like students who maybe aren't good students in the traditional way are like like the all those threats of being in a, in a classroom that I kind of talked about in the presentation they kind of go away when we're just playing games together and you get to see like all of this emergent creativity that never would have been there before so like the bringing games and pedagogy together is just so exciting to me um on the side of like thinking about swearing and, and, and improper behavior in the classroom um there's also that risk as well with bringing games into the class and early on i mentioned it, our first play session was in kingdom and i actually had like a fairly negative interaction between two students just happen and i had to do a bunch of mediation and one-on-one -on -one conversations, which I was not anticipating, and I've never had to in any other class that I've taught. Um, and that came out of play. And there was a, it was a, there's situations that can occur when students maybe have experience with games, tabletop games, especially outside of class, and bring negative play cultures or table cultures from other games into the classroom and then interact with students who've don't have those cultures. And so there's definitely some complexity and risk there when you're facilitating games in class. But the opportunity, like 
this is the funnest, <laughs> like the funnest class to run as an instructor. Um, so it's like the opportunity is, is really amazing. But uh, what Catherine said about scaffolding is really, really important if you're going to be facilitating games in a class. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I wanted just to add to, to all these comments is just only um, uh, an experience that we have had during this year. We have developed several researches in, in schools, applying board games in, in school settings. And we, we know that several schools never uh, used board games in their classrooms before we, we proposed them just to, to be in our research. And then when we finished the, the research, they told us, the teachers told us that from now on, they are going to, to apply board games uh, during their classes because they have seen uh, the, the, the power of them, not only because of the results that we have found, that if, if it's okay, uh, I, I can share these, these results uh, to you the next year when we have processed all the data, if it's the case, but because they were watching all that reactions that you are uh, talking about. Uh, children that are usually not motivated for taking the classes, just begin to, to be more um, active during classes. And then I think that maybe we, we, we cannot use uh, board games and gaming for all the activities when, when we teach anything. But when you find the right moment, the right game to play with your students, it's, it's a wonderful experience and, and it's, it's so motivating that I think that all the students uh, see you in another way from now on. These are some wonderful answers. And um, yeah, we, we have many questions queuing up, so I'm going to move it along. Um, and we still have plenty of time for Q and A's, which is uh, really wonderful. Uh, the first question uh, is from Brian, and it's for Catherine. Um, but of course, with any of these questions, if anybody else wants to chime in, please feel free to just you know insert yourself into the answer and have a conversation on it. Um, wondering if you did any qualitative uh, analysis on Amazon text reviews to see if, for example, folks buying Wingspan and reviewing it on Amazon were actually playing it with children, or whether families buying games were ever surprised or disappointed by their complexity. Um, I have not yet done the qualitative analysis. Um, I know anecdotally um, that people do find it more complicated than it's recommended. I'm actually um, in Elizabeth Hargrave's playtesting group as well, and we live close by. And she has mentioned on several occasions that, like, even though her mo own mother is like brilliant, her own mother can't play wingspan because she doesn't. It's hard for her to learn, and. Um, yeah, that's been I think only my experience with whoever I've tried to play it with. So Elizabeth Hargrave said that to kind of fix this problem, she created like a little tutorial version with like limited rules and easier like a jump start into Wingspan, um, which I think is brilliant. And I actually wish that more existing games would do this because um, even if some families are like, this is too much, I'm just I'm going to put it away. Um, if there's a simpler version, they can enjoy that. And also as a teacher, it makes my life easier because I can play like wingspan in my classroom. I have limited time and I don't have time to teach all these rules, right? But I could jumpstart it and still use it for birds in my biology classroom. So I'm, I'm trying to advocate for designers and publishers to include like a simpler like tutorial version that could be used by more audiences. That um, reminds me of uh, the meme video of Wingspan uh, getting played by... Uh, oh, yeah, it was like Mandy Patinkin. Yeah, Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for the answer, Catherine. Uh, moving on, uh, we have Alexander uh, asking a question to everybody. Um, I'm aware that there are some recent concerns regarding the capture of playing games by capitalism, transforming them as tools for increasing production and satisfaction in the workplace. Do you think this transformation of fun and play into tools for improving efficiency would also apply to usages of games in educational and institutional learning, despite its positive results? Thanks. Yeah, I can, I can speak to this. Um, 
there's there's a huge concern, I think, and like the the hyper commodification of the industry is is like an ever is an ever present present reality. And even among uh, tabletop RPG creators, there's debate about whether or not the hobby should be commercialized and whether selling selling your tabletop role playing game is a is an ethical thing to do. Um, and so there's huge there's huge debate there. And especially when we talk about gamification. Um, yeah, uh, I think <laughs> I think gamif gamification as like a framework for increasing productivity and satisfaction in the workplace. I think there's like a huge like moral quandary to to deal with there. Um, I, speaking to the experience of this class that I was facilitating, the greatest benefit was not in making students more productive or you know making them better workers. But again, I'll emphasize as seeing them like as people as you know, ends in themselves rather than means to producing capital for some organization or, you know, being a, you know, a nice bullet point on a university marketing list. It was that I got to interact with these students as like, like full human beings in a way that I don't often get to experience in, uh, in other class formats. And even as a student myself, like rarely got to experience with, with faculty, especially in larger, um, larger institutions. And so for me, the, the positive experience of games that you know, kind of short circuits the capitalist uh, commodification loop was that we were just, we were just playing. Uh, and I think that, that just playing quality was like a really nice respite for both myself uh, as, as a worker in the institution and as for students who are, you know, constantly beat down by the demands of being in university. Um, but yeah, great, great question. Are there any other folks who want to, to comment? Yes, I can, I can say same thing also. Because I have worked with the gamification in serious games, especially when, when I build them for, for example, I use games for serious games when I want to make a decision making process, for example, for a new urban development to be more democratic. And uh, I use games as ways to engage participants that would never be participating in that kind of process anyway and would not have uh, uh, a vote to say in that matter, for example. When, when I use these games, I usually usually I teach that the game can be whatever we want as designers. We can defend capitalism, we can defend otherwise. So it depends on our purposes. And when we dominate the game design and game elements, you can build whatever we want. And sometimes we can see in these experiences that, for example, uh, players can have more fun not winning the game, but simply playing the game. And winning is something that we can uh, associate with capitalism, being the better, being the best, selling more, win more, have more, something like that. So we can use this, and most of the time I say that if we dominate these game elements, we can build whatever games we like, and we might not even need to buy games. We can build them. So we can have a lot of different approaches on this matters and we can build our games or uh, have our games and buy more games it all depends whatever we use this knowledge i guess any other thoughts or should we move on to the next question okay moving on laura mitchell asks do you feel that the main contribution of games for education is improving learning or in providing relief from the demands of learning while supporting playfulness? That's a, that's a deep philosophical question right there. Um, I can tackle this. So, I mean, games can be used for different reasons, right? In my classroom, I use games for learning. And that's not just content knowledge, which I do a lot of that, but it's also for um, like beginning of the year, icebreakers where they could run, but there's uh, like also creativity games. Like um, there's one game called Brain Spin that I use, um, which it's kind of like categories where you show like basic icons and you have to like name as many shapes that remind you of, and then you compare. And, and what I found is that um, it encourages creativity. So I'll do that before I teach like experimental design. And I have found over the years, that when they play that game, before they think of experiments to do, 
they are way more creative. Like I guess the juice is flowing and it gets their mind expanded. So uh, games can be used for all different kinds of reasons. Um, I, I, me personally, I'm, I'm not just like, hey, let's have a break and play a game. That's just not how I do it. I know some teachers do, and there is some value in that, but um, I think a lot of them can be used for learning purposes in different ways. Yeah, I think that it depends on your purpose, you know? Um, in, if you, for example, if you want that your students uh, just uh, begin to uh, make additions and subtractions faster, you can make them just uh, putting them uh, additions and subtractions and doing them in a, in a sheet. Or then you can use a board game like seven, eight, nine, or other games, fast games, fillers that uh, you, you have to uh, make several additions and subtractions very fast in order to, to win the game. Okay, uh, we have tried this in 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 a past research that we hope just to publish in in several months, and we found that um, students are more motivated to make these, these, these uh, additions and subtractions, for example, and they are, uh, as they are making more subtractions lately, they are better subtracting and, and, and making additions too, okay? So uh, if, if it's only because uh, students are more motivated to to, to, to make these kind of repetitive uh, actions that they can improve their, their academic skills. Just it, it, it's a good choice to, to use these kind of board games. And as Catherine has said, you can also um, enhance creativity using board games and a lot of uh, different uh, academic uh, outcomes, you know, and also we, we found in, in our researches that if you if you uh, enhance the executing function that are at the base level for making um, any educative skill such as calculating or reading, uh, you surely are going to facilitate your students just to um, uh, learn all different and new things better than if they have not developed properly their executive functions, you know? So um, there, you have a lot of benefits, direct benefits, but also indirect benefits when you use board games. But as I've said before, it depends on what your objective and maybe uh, not all the uh, educative uh, outcomes are properly uh, used with board games, you know? Uh, you, you, you have to use the, the proper board game just to uh, enhance the academic skill you, you want to enhance in your, in your students. Can I follow you, George? Very fast. In my experience, I, when I create a game to address a topic, and this, I do this because I mostly work with serious games, what I uh, experience in the reality is that they learn a much, much more beyond what I've defined, uh, what I wanted them to learn. So the, I think this is the one of the strongest features of games. When you, even when we try to build a game to teach something, they learn much more of other stuff that we are not intended to in the first place. I think that's these are some wonderful answers. I'm going to move on to the next question, um, which I'm sure you'll also have a little bit to, to say about. Um, my students also swear and shriek when they we've played games in my course. It's a college course. Um, however, I've noticed some of this unexpected behavior also leads to more bonding, breaking down of barriers. I've seen more students exchange numbers and make plans outside of class. Have you noticed the same? And I think this also goes to other folks because I assume you're all teaching games in the courses you uh, use to. Yes, of course. As I <laughs> said, when, when they, they do this, it means that they are comfortable. They are in a safe space and that they forgot that they are being evaluated. So this is very powerful. And when they do this, I've noticed that they started to see me as more as a peer and not as uh, the formal 
teacher. But this can have some problems because we can, we we can uh, they can cross the boundaries and we can lose the control of the class. So this is something like Eric said and uh, Catherine said and George. This is much about our skills as facilitators and as teachers to control these kinds of situations. And this is why I said to them, doing a kind of a debriefing, that in a normal situation, this will not be acceptable. And this uh, has these results, and, and then this is different. So something like that. I would definitely say yes about the bonds um, between students. Um, several of my students like lived on campus, and so they um, so they knew each other from from campus activities uh, outside of class. But the just the bonds, especially through story games, um, not just trophy, but all of the games that we played, um, we would spend a full three hour seminar session playing this game and weaving this collaborative story together. And there's something like really quite powerful in that, and especially when. Um, your students are coming together and um, uh, coming together with this, this desire to be collaborators and to be open to one another uh, and to yes and each other in that improvisational way. Um, there's something really like powerful and and um, yeah, it's just like it's just it's very nice to see as an instructor. Uh, there's always I've said this before and just like Michael was saying, there's always there's always pitfalls, there's always risks to to be aware of as an instructor. And as the instructor, you have responsibility there to make sure you're like, you're shepherding and taking care of your students. Um, like as a DM, you know, outside of the classroom in general, that's that's important. Um, but the the opportunities and the joy of seeing seeing that like happen in class is, is really quite something. I'm going to um, move on to okay. the next, right. next question mm -hmm. um, because two questions popped up and they're both pretty good. So I want to make sure but we can come back to this one if we have time after. Um, we have a question from Zach um, Fema, Fema Vongsky. What kind of assessments can one implement outside of traditional paper testing to show academic administrators that certain education games are beneficial for students in the classroom? Hi, Zach, I can answer that. Um, so at least in K through 12, administrators really care about our standards of learning tests, which unfortunately. Um, and so kind of the holy grail of our research is to show that classrooms that use games will perform better on these standardized tests than ones that don't. And I think people are working on that. And I've done like little pilot things of my own that I need to really expand. Um, but um, in the classroom for me, I do different assessments based on the games that we play. Um, so like reflections or experimental design, or um, I can do my own little measurements of any kind of assessment that I want with me. It's just that it all comes down to for my school, will my students perform better on these tests? Um, sadly enough, but you can do different things in the classroom, mix it up, exit tickets, essays, whatever you need to do and compare them to past years or have, I don't want to say a control group because I don't want one class not to, to learn, but yes, yeah, some kind of thing like that. I'm going to move us on to the final question, just being mindful of time. But again, the Discord is there for conversation on all of these questions moving on beyond the panel. So please move the conversation there um, if you have more questions for the panelists, because this has been fantastic. Um, the final question is, what are your recommendations for nurturing a student's love of games in a way that can grow beyond the classroom? What kind of interactions do you encourage with parents to encourage games at home or ways to encourage other community play outside of the classroom? Can I say something? Yeah. For, for example, my students were all adults. They are not children. Um, and, and 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 this relates to the previous question, how to measure this. Some students invited other students to participate. Uh, I believe this answers uh, the question and the, the frequency of the participation in class because they are free to come or not to come. Uh, this also provides us some data to present and the projects that they do. Uh, for example, for my students, most of them did not knew these kinds of games. And I've incentivized them to participate in the local communities. 
because every city, medium or major has its local group, local shop, local community where they can try games with the community. And I incentivize them to go to those communities. And for example, because they are college students in universities, they can build their own clubs. And some of the institutions provide them money to buy games and to have these kinds of clubs as social and cultural activities. I know some of these in Portugal, where these are activities to foster the, the social bonds of students from different courses, different classes. So I, I, I incentivize them giving these examples that they can uh, know more students, more colleagues through games. Anyone have a last little bit, 30 second comment on this? I'd say games are fun, but people like, <laughs> it's kind of a silly statement, but games are fun and Sadly, a lot of people have negative experiences with games in either with families, with friends, either it's, you know, it's a painful experience, it's an unsafe experience, it's, it's too challenging, you know, whatever the reason, um, that fun disappears and games become associated with something else. Um, so cultivating fun, uh, you know, however you need to do that, creating a safe space for fun to happen, um, that was that was what I experienced in this class, at least, was seeing students who'd never played a tabletop role playing game, just like going out and finding games they wanted to play with their friends at the end of the semester, based on you know what we played in class, and that they they had discovered that fun and wanted to bring that into their own lives, and that was really quite wonderful. I think that's a great note to end this on. Um, let's give our panelists a wonderful round of applause. Um, please, please, please take this conversation that is really happening right now to the Discord and continue to, to discuss. Um, we'll be back in about 30 minutes with our next panel, which is on um, sexualities at play. Um, and uh, I just a final reminder that, again, there is a reception at the end of the day after the keynote um, at 9 p.m. So as a reception in Town Hall, please remember to come and join us then. And with that, we'll see you in 30 minutes.